October 1988, San Quentin Prison, California's death row. Stanley Tookie Williams, founder of the Crips, walks past a shower and a fellow Crip lunges out, stabs him in the neck with a four and a half inch knife and throws it. When Tookie is taken in for medical treatment, his only statement is, I don't know what happened, I don't remember. But who was this other Crip who dared to stab the infamous Stanley Tookie Williams? His name was Tyquan Cox, AKA Lil Fee, and he was a member of one of Los Angeles's, perhaps the largest black street gang, the Rolling 60s Crips. And he's definitely one of the guys that made Rolling 60s a very feared name in the streets of Los Angeles. Tyquan Cox's trip to death row started actually all the way back in 1983 in Watts at a party for a 21-year-old girl on her birthday. And it led to a quadruple homicide in 1984 for which he was convicted. This infamous crime came just on the heels of the successful completion of the 1984 Olympics in the peak of Reagan era and the Cold War. It was the time when, the show you guys are watching right now, snowfall, when those events were happening. And that was the same time when Los Angeles was replacing Miami as the cocaine importation capital in the United States. And it was a time when gang violence went from just in certain neighborhoods in LA to being endemic around the city. Uh, crews like Third World, Whitey Enterprise, and Ozone were blamed for 25 murders in eight months. Too many people are getting killed. The white man tried to make money off of it. You see they record? Welcome to 63rd Street, home turf of the Rolling 60s, part of the largest street gang in all of Los Angeles, a gang called the Crips. What it means to the community, to the community it means terrorism, but nevertheless, you know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? To us it's just like, hey. Meet Creeper, Lowdown, Little Creeper, and Mr. E-Bone. I mean, we've been on TV, we've been in the newspapers. Everywhere we go, we take over. It's just like we're a nightmare on somebody's like street. Like a plague. <laughs> They'd like you to believe that they're the worst thing to hit civilization since Attila the Hun. Because on these streets, reputation is everything, whether it's earned or not. That's like what plague. it is. After you hear so much about it, it gets into you if it's not, not already there. You know? It's, like I said, Now what do you love. do? What do you do that makes people so fearful? <laughs> we can walk into a place and that'll make people fearful just knowing that it's rolling 60s. The name And what it carries behind it. Like uh, what does it carry behind it? It carries dirt, carries murder, carries whatever you want. Treachery. Just pure treachery. After a successful NFL career, Kerman Alexander had come back uh, to the town that, that birthed him. Uh, and specifically the Watts neighborhood. He had grown up in the Jordan Downs projects and he started um, a youth football league. And one of his most promising students was the future murderer of his family, Tyquan Lofi Cox. Tyquan Cox was a football and basketball prodigy and Kermit Alexander remembered, remembered him from his uh, time in his youth football league, but Little Fee didn't play well with others. Um, a court psychiatrist testified uh, during his murder trial of Alexander's family later on that by the age of 12, Tyquan Cox had had up to 15 separate experiences that each alone would qualify him for having PTSD. And uh, his co-defendant, Horace Burns, had this to say about him. Little fee, he don't think at all. And Tyquan Cox himself said that at a very young age he learned how to quote block out his own thoughts but of course the real question is who were they going to kill and why because it wasn't intended to be kermit alexander's family so like i said it goes back to a birthday party in watts in 1983 young lady was turning 21 at a bar that goes on vermont a fight broke out amongst some guys there at the bar and someone fired a shot. This girl on her 21st birthday was hit and paralyzed. So she began, like anybody would do, a lawsuit against the bar, assuming 
they had liability insurance. After all, she was going to have to be cared for in a wheelchair for the rest of her life. Now, the bar was owned by a guy named Ossie Jackson, a.k.a. Diamond Jack, who had various arrests that make it appear that he was some sort of maybe a gangster, numbers guy, maybe drugs. And um, uh, the prosecution's version of events is that he put a $60,000 bounty on a 21-year-old girl. And another Rolling 60s crip named Charles Darren Williams uh, took him up on the offer. Apparently, though, none of the gang members ever implicated uh, uh, Diamond Jack. And he's never been charged with anything, though the lawsuit was dropped after Kermit Alexander's family was killed. I won't go into the details of the murders, it really doesn't matter, but to quote the song Drive By Miss Daisy from MC8, they ran through the rooms and went pop, pop, pop. And when it was over, six-year-old and 12-year-old boys were dead. Kermit Alexander's 59-year-old mother and his sister were also all killed. A fifth potential victim, uh, I think a 15 or 16-year-old nephew, kind of wrestled with one of the gunmen and he was the sole survivor. If you're interested in this story, you should really get Kermit Alexander's book, which is called In the Valley of the Shadow of Death. It just came out a few years ago. It uh, has a lot of information about not just the case, but uh, Lil Fee's childhood. And it actually kind of has a, I won't say a happy ending, but a happy last chapter for Kermit Alexander, who went on to get uh, married late in life and adopted a bunch of orphans from Haiti. So, kind of, um, kind of powerful is one of the things that moved me about the story. Here you have uh, a, a lost and broken child like Taekwon Cox, who's now on death row, and because of what he did, five orphans from Haiti were adopted by an NFL player. So life is very strange that way. Okay, Charles Darren Williams, the guy that supposedly or was convicted of arranging it all. Uh, he was a rolling 60s crip, and he said that he had developed a half an ounce a day crack cocaine habit in the months leading up to the crime. Court appointed psychiatrist backed this up, and um, one of the women that drove the van that was used in the killing testified that she saw him spend about $40,000 in a brief period of time after the murder. There was also a, a car dealer that testified he paid for a car in cash. As for Lil Fee, his uh, wars uh, on death row continued. In 1998, five bloods attacked him, and in retaliation the next day, he speared one of them through the cell bars in the hole in death row. And then in 2000, Lil Fee did something that made him, you know, in a way, public enemy number one within death row. So, you know, he's living a life where it's like you're already at the bottom of the darkest hole in the ground and they're going to keep putting you in deeper holes. So in 2000, he led another crip named Nono and a Samoan crip in a, not so much an escape attempt from prison, but they broke out of death row and they tried to get into where the guards were. Now, uh, of course, the plot was, was thwarted. They did get through a fence, but this is where the story, from a psychological standpoint, takes another level of interest to me. Taekwon Cox got put inside the hole within uh, uh, death row and his internal energy and his spirit of fighting against the system was so strong, he refused all his personal possessions, he refused a TV, he even refused a mattress. And for some years, he lived, I guess, in an empty cement cell. The guard said he never turned or rarely turned his lights off, and he worked out incessantly all day, burpees, push-ups, sit-ups and they said they barely ever saw him go to sleep. So, you know, that's the kind of energy that makes somebody become a billionaire or the president of the United States. 
and who knows what he would have been if whatever went on in his childhood and on the streets there in the mid 80s in LA wouldn't have happened to him. But Taekwon Cox sat in the hole on death row, no mattress, no TV for many years. So Taekwon Cox is only in his mid 50s now and no, he's on death row and serving this long term. There's a push to let elderly prisoners out because they're so expensive and they so uh, uh, rarely reoffend. So who knows, in maybe 10 or 15 more years, Lil' Fee will be back on the streets. And again, if you're more interested in this case, and it's, it's, it's dark and it really gives you insight into what the real real gang members that make people afraid of gangs or just street people in general are about. You should read Kermit Alexander's book in the Valley of the Shadow of Death. There's a lot of, there's some documents about Taekwon Cox growing up. It explains how, you know, becoming uh, a snitch in a case like this or turning against your co-defendants always doesn't play out too well. A guy named Horace Burns, you know, he was probably the getaway driver and he tried to blame it on everyone else. He got life too. He didn't go to death row, but he got life. So he spent the last 30 years moving from prison to prison, probably in PC, and he's not in PC till they find out. You can stop gang banging, you know, but you still gonna always have crip in your heart. And there's trouble wherever you go. Regardless if you're cripping or not. That's right. Just like these innocent people that's getting shot. They just stand in crip neighborhoods or blob neighborhoods, and they getting blasted on. Lil Fee, Taekwon Cox, powerful story, Kermit Alexander in the Valley of the Shadow of Death. Go buy his book, Al Prophet, American Dope.